go over this. How many of you are maybe maybe familiar with the phrase uh, tish, tish, uh, Tisha B'Av? Nobody's familiar with Tisha B'Av? Um, it's a it's it's a not a feast. It's not a festival, but it is um, a recognized period of time that takes place uh, right before the forty days of trumpets. So just, and if you're making notes, if you're taking notes this morning, make a note that on August the 10th on our calendar is actually the month of Elul, the beginning of the month. It is on the first, uh, this is the first of Elul, which begins the 40 days of repentance. That's the 40 days of uh, Teshuvah um, or the, the Feast of Trumpets. So Elul 1 begins that and it culminates with the last 10 days of those 40 days with Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, so that, which is the Day of Atonement. So we are quickly approaching uh, that period of time that is, of course, very prophetic. And um, there are a lot of implications in terms of what's going on in Israel right now. Uh, it seems like nowadays, last four or five years, there are always huge implications in terms of what's going on in Israel. How many of you know there was a earthquake in Israel two days ago? Earthquake in Israel, it was a 5.4. So it was a mid-level earthquake that took place in uh, Jerusalem, um, right where I should say right near Jerusalem. It was in Israel, and I th wasn't it just south of Jerusalem? I think it, I, th I could be wrong, but I think it was just south of Jerusalem, not very many miles at all. Um, you could probably walk it in a day. That's how close it was to, to Jerusalem itself. So, I mean, we, we, man, there's all just all kinds of things happening. But I want to give you a little bit of some history about Tishbaav because um, it is a, an extremely important day. And some of the things that I'm going to show you this morning, um, I hope, Hopefully, it will blow your mind, and I always say that. That's my favorite thing. You know, it'll blow your mind. It'll knock your hair off and make it grow back, and, and they have an emoji. They have a blow your mind emoji, so just think blow your mind emoji. Um, but this, uh, this particular time, um, its height takes place in the month of Av. So many of you probably wondering uh, what in the world these references are. These are months on the calendar in the Hebrew calendar. So the month of Tammuz and the month of, of, of Av. Now right now, um, right now it is, let's see, this is, what's today, the 8th of, yep, okay, so this is, it's right now, it is the 25th, I'm almost positive. It is the 25th of Tammuz, um, on the Hebrew calendar as we stand. So we are approaching the month of Av, and at the, at the beginning of Tammuz, Tammuz is a, a month in which the 17th, it begins, there's a fast that begins. And this fast on the Hebrew calendar is, is a preparation for what is getting ready to come. So as I told you on, on uh, August 10th, um, our calendar uh, this year is Elul 1. And Elul 1, of course, is uh, the month that begins the month of repentance. The month of repentance, you will also hear it referred to in Hebrew as uh, Teshuvah. And so teshuva or repentance, this begins in the month of, of Elul. So what you actually have, and, and if I can give you, I'll just give you a really, I'll give you a really brief timeline. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be, but just so you can see how this runs. Uh, you have Tammuz. And then you have the month of Av. And as you run on that timeline, then you have Elul um, and the 40 days of trumpets. So, so right around here on the 17th of Tammuz, 
there is pretty much a cycle, and I never realized this before. Uh, there is pretty much a cycle that begins, that runs straight in to the 40 days of trumpets that I never, I never, ever saw before. And I'm about to tell you why this is incredibly important, incredibly significant. Um, and then the ninth of Av is, is basically when this culminates. Um, this is what is referred to as the lowest point on the Hebrew calendar in the entire year. It's the most mournful day, the month of Av, and I'm about to tell you why. And the 15th of Av is considered the happiest day. So we have two contrasting themes here. And I know you're saying, David, will you please just get to why? I'm so glad you asked because I'm about to. So we begin this time, this, 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 this time of, of, of mourning. It begins with a fast on the 17th of Tammuz. And then what happens is um, during, during this time on the, the 9th, it, boils, it goes down to the, to the month of Av and the 9th of Av. Historically, there are several things that happen in the nation of Israel, and one of them is uh, recorded in Numbers chapter 33, verse 38, okay? And this is where the high priest Aaron dies. And everybody is familiar with Aaron, right? He's basically the first high priest of the nation of Israel. This is, this is Moses' brother, and he, he comes out of Egypt with Moses and, and Miriam, and this is when he dies. He dies... Uh, a beloved high priest, the first high priest, he dies on the ninth of Av. And ninth of Av, also known as Tishbeav, is also, like I said, the lowest point in a three-week period of mourning that begins with this fast on the 17th of Tammuz. It acknowledges also not only the death of the high priest of Aaron, but it, it acknowledges the breach of the walls of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, in the year 586 B.C., okay? And then just a few weeks later, uh, from the 17th of Tammuz down to the 9th of Av, the 9th of Av also marks not only the death of the high priest Aaron, but it marks the, the date of the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians, all right? Are you guys with me? It also marks, okay, it also marks several other things in Jewish history that are extremely, um, I guess you could say, let's just be honest and let's say it's depressing. It is, it is not something you want to remember, but they do remember it. The ninth of Av is also the date of the destruction of the second temple. Believe it or not, not a coincidence. It is the date of the destruction of the second temple, which happens in 70 A.D. So here already we've got, we've got three things um, that take place. Uh, the death of Aaron, the high priest Aaron, the destruction of the first temple, 586 BCE, the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, and then there's a couple of other things that happened several hundred years later. The expulsion of the Jews from Spain in what is known as the Spanish Inquisition. It is a tremendous torment of the Jewish people in the country of Spain, and there were many Jews that were slaughtered, that were killed in this expulsion when they ran the Jews out of Spain. And guess when it took place? Does anybody want to tell me? On the 9th of Av, at the day of Tishba Av. Also, in the expulsion, to go back just a little bit, in the expulsion of the Jews in England, if you know a little history, there was also a great persecution of the Jewish people in England, and they were run out of the city of, of England in the year 1290 um, A.D. Or, or Common Era, C.E. And so there are a lot of things that take place, that happen, that culminate on this ninth of, of Av, Tishba Av, which is why you have the Av. It is, it is what, we, what they mark as this lowest point. And they remember this, but there is something that's really 
interesting about this whole thing because you would say to yourself, why in the world would I want to remember every year something that happened that that was that bad? Especially if you had loved ones that you saw were killed or slaughtered in any way, shape, form, or fashion. You would, want, you would not want to remember that. You wouldn't want to remember your home being burned down and, and, and foreigners coming in and invading and taking over the city and basically controlling it for a number of decades after that. This is not something we sit around and go, oh, the date's coming up. <laughs> I mean, nobody does that, right? Nobody remembers those bad things. But this is an amazing thing because the Jews don't just remember the ninth of Av in a way that is depressing. But they remember the ninth of Av in a way that is uh, very celebratory because mixed with grief in the middle of all of this, there's hope. Mixed with grief, there is hope in all of this. And it's amazing because when you really begin to study the events, and I'm not going to go into that today, but when you begin to study the events of the destruction of the temple in 586 BCE, and when you begin to study the destruction of of the temple in 70 AD, um, you, you understand that these were very pivotal moments. They were, they were moments that were sort of on the edge of a knife, okay? And they could have gone either way. The destruction, if, if, if there had been just a couple of actions, okay, that Israel would have taken in 586 B.C., one of them being, and the biggest probably, being repentance before God. And simultaneously with that repentance, being obedience, that whole thing could have gone a completely different direction. It literally stood on the edge of a knife. What was destruction could have very easily been one of the greatest victories in all of Israel's history in 586. In 70 A.D., when the destruction of the temple took place there, there were a lot of different things that were involved, one of which was pride, extreme arrogance amongst the Jews. And if they had just but humbled themselves once again, repented and obeyed the Lord, the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. would not have gone down as one of the most sorrowful times In Israel history, but it would have gone down as yet again one of the greatest victories in all of the nation's history. And it stood on the edge of a knife just by a couple of things. And they sound like it's simplistic, but it's also huge. It's minuscule, but it's also big. It's very large because God does not look lightly on humility, and repentance, and obedience. In fact, that is what God uses to reward us. That's where the blessing of God comes through. That's where triumph comes through. That's where the victory of God that he promises us, if you will do this, if you will but obey, if you will remember my statutes, if you will remember my commandments, then I, the Lord your God, will remember you. I will not forget you. I will not forsake you. I will not abandon you, but I will rescue you in times of trouble. I will supply your every need, and I will turn back your enemies. And that was the promise of God. And so in the middle of this, this, we have this sorrow, but we also have this hope. We've got this hope. And right now, we're in the middle of this very season. In fact, the Jews in Israel are recognizing right now Tish B'Av as we're now in the 25th of Tammuz. And we're coming, excuse me, coming close, <laughs> by the choke, coming close to the 9th of Av. And then after that, you go to the 15th of Av, right? Now, this 21-day period of, like I said, Tish B'Av is a, is a fast, and it draws in and prepares the people for repentance or teshuva, the period that immediately follows this particular point on the calendar. And it begins a little first 
which is August 10th on our calendar. And it continues through the month of Elul, and it all of all in all this whole period from this time until the end. And by the way, guess guess what day you have at the end of this you have Rosh Hashanah. And then you have Yom Kippur that will wrap up this whole seven week period. Okay? This whole seven and it isn't it interesting that interesting that it is a seven week period that runs from Tishbaav all the way to Yom Kippur. Seven weeks that involves mourning, a humbling, a humility, a fast, and then brings us to uh, rejoicing. It brings us to possible judgment, but then it also brings us to a happy day. Again, the, the day of atonement, the day of Yom Kippur. But guess what day, just so, just as a side note here, just so if you're taking notes, guess what day Rosh Hashanah takes place on this year? September 11th on our calendar. Pretty interesting, right? What does it mean? I don't know. I just find it really interesting that it takes place on 9-11 this year. The half Torah readings, which are the readings from the prophets during Sabbath days, during this period, uh, for each of the seven weeks, foretell of the Jews during a time of sorrow, the half Torah readings foretell of a glorious future for the nation of Israel. A, a future that is yet to come, a future that has not yet, it prophesies of a, of a time period, a messianic reign that has not taken place yet, all right? And this is pretty amazing because this messianic reign, it foretells and it talks about Tishbaab, just so you have a couple of scripture references, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 8 through 9. This this time of Tishbaav is mentioned in that in that uh, particular script reference. Also, Jeremiah fifty two verses twelve through thirteen, Tishbaav is mentioned in this as well. And there are several other verses throughout the Old Testament when this is talked about, um, and I believe even in the New Testament. And then there is also a Talmud reference. It's uh, the Talmud. Ta'arit, and it's 29a, just one of the references that the Talmud um, talks about this. And I believe it's even, if I'm not mistaken, if I read, I could be wrong, but it's recorded also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the time of Tishba'av, Tishba'av, and its correlation not only to the sorrows of Israel, but also a time of great victory, a messianic age, a time when Yeshua HaMashiach will return, not like he did the first time on a donkey, but he will come on a horse and he will rule his people Israel and they will rule the world for a thousand years, a messianic age. So this, this alludes to this. And the half Torah readings for this whole seven-week period allude to this prophecy. And like I said, the low point, the three weeks, is expressed in the first day um, of Tishbaav, it begins in the very first time with, uh, the very first day rather, with a 25 hour fast. Interesting. I'm not going to get into the particular of that because some of you know there are how many hours in the day? There are 24. Very interesting that it talks about it, with all of these feasts that, that come and go into the latter part of the fall and into the last days. There seems to be always this hint of something that takes place that is not really a proper time signature. It's almost out of time, just like the long day. And then you have the fast of Tishbaav on the first day of Av, a 25-hour fast. If that's not curious, I don't know what is, okay? And then what they do, how many of you ever wondered why in the world they put in the book of Lamentations in the Bible? I'll just be honest with you, I did. Out of all the things that happened, why do we have to have a whole book 
that dis- and you know, and you know what lamentations means that mean it's it's basically a book of sorrow it's a book of depression it's a book of bad things happen to good people it's a book of Where was God at during all of these troubles? Are you all with me? This is the book of Lamentations. How many of you just want to have this desire to sit down and just, you know what? I'm just in the mood to read Lamentations today. You know, you just you just have this skip in your step and a blue bird on your shoulder and you just want to read Lamentations, you know. I mean, I've never heard anybody come up to me and say, man, how's it going? How you doing, man? How's your walk with the Lord? Oh, it's great. I'm reading Lamentations right now. I'm getting so blessed, you know. I've never, and if you guys have, please come and tell me your story because I've never heard anybody come up to me and say they were studying the book of Lamentations and they were just so blessed about it, let let alone just studying the book of Lamentations. But when you read the book of Lamentations, which was read starting at Av 1 during this 25-day fast, the book of Lamentations was read along with, and this is where it's, it's, once again, it's very curious. The book of Lamentations with all of these sorrows is read every day. And of course, every Sabbath day during these seven weeks, victories are read. So you have this, you have this destruction and death and sorrow being read right alongside during these days a victory, and a messianic reign that is to come, you know? And that is because without God, there is only hopelessness. Without God, there is only destruction. And without God, there is only death. Without God, there is only bad things happen to good people. Without God, there are only things that that happen that we question how could an amazing, gracious, good God allow those things to happen. But with God, there is not only sorrow, but there is great victory that will follow. There is not only death and destruction, but there is life and life more abundantly and life eternal that follows after that. And Tishbav is one of those times that it says, hey, I know this happened to you in your life, and I know it was bad, but guess what? There are great days ahead. God is not done yet. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of redemption. I know this happened to you when you were a kid. But God is not done. And what the devil meant for bad, God will work out for your good, for your triumph, for your victory. You're not going to stay at the bottom. You're going to rise to the top. Amen? And this festival says this to the nation of Israel. Yes, you may have been overrun by the Babylonians. Yes, you may have had the temple destroyed, not once but twice. Yes, you may have found great, terrible slaughter and destruction in your nation and and killing of your people, not only in those times, but in other times like 1492 and 1290 and in other times during history. But there is a day coming. You will not stay at the bottom. And this is awesome. The 15th of Av is the high point, okay? The 15th of Av is considered the happiest day because what it does is you only have just 15 days left and people begin to prepare and this whole time begins that preparation, but they begin to prepare even more for the month of Elul, okay? And... As they go into a lull, they know that as they repent. See, see, it, it could come down to Rosh Hashanah, and this is the pivotal point. This is, this is basically, and I never saw this before, what Tish B'Av is all about. Rosh Hashanah is judgment, but it doesn't have to be. Just like 586 and the destruction of the temple didn't have to be destruction. Just like 70 A.D. didn't have to be destruction. Just like 1290 didn't have to be in 1492. Just like, the whole, just like all of those things didn't have to be destruction if you repent before the Lord. And so they have this hope 
that there is a repentance, that if, if we follow after God, maybe this time we'll get it right. Maybe this time we'll repent and we'll obey God and He will hear us. And maybe this time, instead of judgment and destruction, will come prosperity and promotion. Right? And that's why it always stands on the edge of a knife. And they, so they get excited and they look forward to this. Okay? Now this is amazing. This is amazing also. And this is the part that I hope it blows your mind. The 15th of Av is also a marriage holiday. Oh, see, I thought somebody would go, wow, but nobody did that. Nobody did that. This is the time This is the time when the bride is solidified. You remember how I've talked to you that the betrothal, once it takes place, that there is a year period between then and the wedding, and two things happen. The bride prepares herself, right? And the groom goes away to do what? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also, right? During the 15th of Av, the bride for a king is solidified. In other words, the, the, the betrothal has already taken place and you're coming right to the end because Rosh Hashanah is the marriage day. Are you all with me? Rosh Hashanah is the marriage day, right, after, right in that period of time there. And so you only have but a few weeks. And she is, at that moment of time, declared to be ready for her, her groom. Amazing. So we go from great sorrow to great joy. And you know what this this is referring to in the Messianic age, it determines whether or not the bride, the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, if they are ready for the coming of Messiah, which is going to take place a very short few weeks later. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And so we are in this, we are in this time right now, Tishbaav. We're in, uh, or g getting ready to approach, I should say. We're at the 25th of the month of Tammuz. We're quickly approaching Av, and, and what is the lowest and the highest point on the entire, it, it, it's declared that it's even higher than even the Day of Atonement. It's not more holy, but it's happier. Does that make sense? It is the happiest day on the entire Hebrew calendar. Because it not only marks the time of a messianic age, okay, but it marks the fact that, hey, we're getting ready to have the opportunity to correct everything that we've wronged. We have, because with God, guess what? There's always a second chance. There's always a second chance. And it isn't, isn't it amazing that as we approach this time, just a couple of things, I'm going to let you guys go. Isn't it amazing that as we approach this time, a date when the first and second temple were destroyed, that right now there's more talk than ever before about a third temple being built. Pretty amazing. The contrast there of destruction and building. Once again, what is that? It's the edge of the knife. It, is, it could be destruction or it could be victory. And they're talking about right now that third temple being built um, more so than in any other time in modern history. More so than any other time really since the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Right now, and these are the times that you are living in. I'll be excited for you if you can be. 
I'm excited. This is amazing. And all of these things that we just ignore and never knew about in the Bible are pointing us right in the direction, not only of where we are, but where we are headed. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know about you, but as, I, as we come through these days, I just I want to recognize, man, that, that, that Jesus really could be coming, uh, if not this year, some other time. And I know that sometimes people don't want to, to talk about it because people think, well, I've never been to Disney World or I never saw the Grand Canyon. And I mean, I'm just being honest. There are certain people that just they don't want Jesus to come back because they think, well, I've never been married and I've never had kids or or I've never had grandkids, or, or so on and so forth. And it's the selfish desires of the flesh that make us fearful of a joyous ending. We should not be fearful of what is going to happen because our Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and listen, when He comes and we reign with Him, there is nothing, there is nothing on this earth or in this world that will compare to our reign with Messiah. Not grandkids or Disney World or the Grand Canyon or the Taj Mahal or nothing. It will be unlike anything you could possibly ever fathom. In fact, you can't even comprehend it in your natural mind because you're not able. Not until you have a glorified body and use 100% of your brain, if I can put it like that, will you, will you even begin to begin to comprehend the reign of Messiah and our glory in reigning with him. It's amazing. It's awesome. And Jesus is coming soon. Are you all ready? I'm ready. I'm ready.